Okay. Uh, so I want to talk about golden rice. Let me just first, okay, so let me re-ask. Is there anybody in the room who did read the paper? Because it would adjust how I lectured if there was or was not. <laughs> I'm so sad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I understand. I'm just sad. <sighs> I'm just disappointed. <laughs> what the hell is if people not being able to find emails? Um, hang on. I mean, to be fair, it wasn't its own email that was sent out. What? It was an attachment. Yeah, well, okay, wait, what's the better, the blue or the orange for people's visualization? Blue. Blue, okay. Okay, so the premise, so then I'm not gonna like ask interactive questions on, unless certain situations. So essentially rice lacks pro-vitamin A, which is beta carotene which is like an essential vitamin that you need to survive. If you don't have vitamin A, you go blind and bad things happen. And vitamin A deficiency is a very important issue still in third world countries across the world. So try and find solutions to fill the vitamin A deficiency, it's probably a good idea. So the premise is we're gonna to try to solve this with biotechnology. And I should say the paper that we're discussing is Yi, just to be clear, I'm giving references where it's due, Yi et al. 2000 Science. So this, is a, this was a big paper in 2000. Uh, it's a very short paper, it's only three pages, and the data is very easy. So you should take a look at it. So you're gonna to try to solve this question with biotechnology. Um, you can't solve this issue with breeding. So this is, this is, you know, for the people who say, well, we should just be, we should just be breeding stuff. This is an issue that you can't solve with breeding because you can't get beta carotene. There, there aren't any systems for it in rice that are expressing it in the, essentially like the rice seed. So it's not an issue that you can just take different rice strains and like breed it in. So you can't solve it with breeding. So it's kind of like tailor-made problem to try to solve with biotechnology. Um, so how would you start? Maybe it's a good thing you didn't read the paper. How would you start? Like what would be the first steps to do this? With breeding, you said? You can't do it with breeding okay. because the because the no rice strains are expressing beta, are expressing genes that can code for or make sorry not code for there's no genes in rice currently that will make beta carotene in the rice seed which is what people eat. How would you find a plant that does? Okay, so yeah, yeah. So step one is like find find plants that have the genes that can make beta carotene. Find plants with the pathway. Could you like? You try to skip that step just by figuring out what genes do encode for that. You mean play. skip, find out where they are? Well, yeah. Like I mean, like why would I need to figure out what plants do code for that when I can just like look up what genes code for that? Well, you're gonna need it. So I see what you're saying. Like that would kind of be step zero. Yes, is like find some genes. Like find the pathway. Find the pathway. But if you're ever actually gonna fix the problem, you need to grab the genes from somewhere to move them, right? So then your next step would be, okay, now that we know the pathway, like which ones are we gonna take from where? So, so both of these are, are true. Um, <laughs> disrupt my video. Okay, so it's very simple. Uh, oh, okay, so wait, so then imagine you found the pathway. The pathway is actually only three genes. You only need three genes. They only need to add three genes. So then what would you do? If you only need those three, you just pull them out. Just pull it out of the, um, the DNA. Clone them. Yeah. Clone the genes, okay, and then what's step three? 
So if this was an essay test question, like tell me the algorithm to make rice express or make beta carotene, what would be step three? Uh, like try to get in the rice somehow. How? So like, probably put it on a plasmid and then put it tightly right through. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. So again, this is a follow-up for from the agrobacterium lecture, and then what you're supposed to watch for today was the micropropagation lecture. All that is essentially like how to do plant transgenesis. So this paper is essentially just like allowing us to discuss an actual application of plant transgenesis. So you would use, and they did use, agrobacterium for this. So they're using the TI plasma. Okay, so that's the premise. That's the setup. Uh, there's a fourth detail. The fourth detail. Like, what are we? What are we not thinking about? What's a special? Imagine, like, we don't even necessarily care about these genes. Let's say it's just A, B, C. What's a detail that we're not thinking about that's going to make or break this strategy? What, what part of the rice is the part that people eat? Um, what? Yeah, the seed. And they use the term endosperm. I'm not a plant person, but endosperm is what they use. I mean, it's just the seed. So what's the detail we're missing to make this work? Is it the difference between gametes and somatic cells? I mean, I think you can explain it. Kind of. I mean, yeah, that's definitely like, but fill in the detail that we're missing. Like you're on the right track. Like make this construct a little bit more detailed. What what's it missing? Some sort of like localization. Like it needs to know where. It needs localization to is going to be within a cell. Oh, like localization is actually important. Like let's come back to that. But what were you going to say? Where um, are you like targeting? Like where's the agrobacterium targeting? What do you mean by that? Like, if it is in the soil or something, like, I, I know you're doing it in the lab, but like, to get it to be in the seeds? Okay, so you've hit the issue, like, how do you get it to be in the seeds? It's like random stuff. Well, it's going to be a random insertion, but but that has nothing, as long as you get it in a chromosome of like, a, like you could just take seeds, or what they do is they form a callus, from the micropropagation lecture, like you can take parts of plants and regenerate whole plants from them. That's the advantage of plants. So don't worry about too much about like how to get the insert in something that can generate a plant. Like that part's easy. But your question is, how do you get that, the beta carotene, in the seeds? Like there's something that's obvious that we're missing, a detail that's not been drawn into this construct. Just think back to like normal structures of genes. Like what's promoters? missing? Yes. So like what kind of a promoter are you going to want? Phosphatidine. What? Phosphatidine. Constitutive, maybe. So, okay. So maybe constitutive. Oh, that way, this is actually a good discussion. So constitutive will get it expressed in the seed, but what might be bad about constitutive expression? Do you really want the plant spending lots of energy to make beta carotene in like the stalks and the leaves? No. So this might not be the best choice, but it, it could in theory like work, but maybe it would lower yield. Although they do, they do in some cases use some constitutive promoters. Could the promoter, would you like a promoter that's dependent on something that the plant can actually like metabolize? I think you guys are thinking about this like way too deeply. Like where do you want them to express? You want them to express in the seeds. So you probably want to put like a seed promoter. Seeds seeds like, like, I'm, like, I think you're like way overthinking this. Like, they, they, what they want to do is they want to put an endosperm-specific promoter in front of these genes in this pathway, so that again, like, the important point here is it's not enough to just like make the beta carotene. It's got to be made in the spot that people eat, right? So that's that's like the issue that that they're solving. Um. Localization is also important, but it's at a level of detail we probably won't discuss. But they do send one of the proteins to like the chloroplasts, and that is a part of that is involved by putting this little like TPE peptide 
in one of these genes. So that is important, but I probably like, won't dig into that in detail. Okay, so that's the premise. Okay, so the first thing that they do is they first just like test out, or actually let's, let's write out the names of the genes. You don't need to memorize these for the test. Um, I'm just writing them out. One of these genes is called Psi. One of these genes is called CRTL. And one of these genes is called LCY. Just know that like, if you have these three genes, you can make beta carotene. And rice doesn't have these genes. So, I mean, for all purposes, you can literally just say like one, two, three. Like you need three genes. Um, so they build a construct. The construct looks, I'll draw it out, looks something like this. Uh, sorry, this is going to take me a second to just make sure I get all this properly drawn. Okay, so this is the first construct they're working with. They're not trying to add all three genes at the same time. I think in the first construct, they were probably like, it was probably like in an intermediate stage of building this, and they're probably kind of like, well, let's test it. Let's see if we can get some data from it. Um, so this was the first construct. So it's got one and two genes for synthesis of beta carotene, but not the third one. And it's got this, APH4. You don't need to know this for the test, but this is a selection cassette. And it's hygromycin. So what you do need to know for the test is that any kind of insertion is gonna require a selection regime. So their selection regime here is hygromycin. It's an antibiotic that is going to affect the chloroplasts. So similar like canamycin. And it, I think it actually inhibits protein synthesis in the chloroplast. Um, okay, we sh it is worth digging into these promoters. And one of these promoters is worth memorizing. So I'm going to consider one of these fair game for the test, which is this 35S promoter. Does anybody know what this promoter is? You guys have actually seen this promoter before. Is that like the, the full construct of the ribosome? No, so if you, yes, I see what you're thinking. Like sometimes if you see S, it means subunit. And so sometimes you automatically think this is associated with the ribosome, but it's not. This is, that's, this is not a ribosomal promoter or gene. I don't think that's what the S stands for in this ribosomal stuff. It's well, like RPS, ribosomal protein subunit one, if you have like RPS one. Yeah, but like if you have like ADS RNA, it's the, like a molecular weight measure. It's, it's, it's like a- Yeah, yeah, no, I know that. And I know there's big like components of the ribosome that are labeled by that. But if you actually look at the genes, the names for different subunits of those bigger subunit complexes, some of the genes are actually literally called RPS, Gotcha, okay. Uh, and you can see ribosomal protein subunit. Like sometimes that actually, sometimes the S does mean subunit, sometimes it does not. Yeah, like and it definitely does not protein. mean subunit here. So this is, this is a virus promoter. And it's from the, I'm not gonna write it out. It's from the cauliflower mosaic virus. So this is the promoter that you see in Wilson and Alex work all the time. They're using this promoter. Why, why would people like a virus promoter? Well, let me first ask. So I guess uh, well, we have seen some virus promoters that are inducible, like the Lambda promoter was heat shock inducible. The 35S promoter is constitutive. So this is a constitutive promoter um, and it's very highly expressed 
because it's kind of from like a pathogenic virus. And the virus's job is to get into cells and like make them start making their own proteins. So if you see a 35S promoter in plant biotechnology, it's a virus promoter that's causing strong constitutive expression. So they have this promoter in front of their selection cassette, which makes sense. And they have this promoter in front of this gene too. So Santa, where you are correct, some of the genes are using a constitutive promoter. This one they put with a endosperm promoter. So for like tests, I would never require you to remember like this specific name of this promoter, but I would require you to know there is such things as like endosperm promoter, like seed promoter, or in like a fruit fly, there's like eye promoters, wing promoters, things like that. Yes. Um, if you were to say like on the exam, throw out the first construct from the golden mice conjure or something, would we need to know that the specific virus promoters were for those two genes? I wouldn't, I would not ask you that. I, I will not ask you that. Uh, with respect to like maybe the question you're referring to was the TN5 question, like draw out the TN5. Yeah. That one I required because TN5 is like a key tool in biotechnology. And I wanted, especially like my people to know, like how to, how that draw, how to draw that out. This, like this construct is for one specific application, which is like, let's make rice, make beta carotene. So I would not require you to know this because it's not a broad tool for biotechnology, but I probably might ask you questions about the TI plasmid, structure of the TI plasmid, because that is a tool in biotechnology that you need to understand. Does that make sense? Like, do you understand like how I'm discriminating what detail is important and what detail is not important? And like, the, back to this again, like the idea that you can get promoters that are like rice endosperm specific is an important concept that underlies many applications in biotechnology. Okay, so this is one construct. Um, and actually, it's interesting. What they, what they call these things are LB and RB, and they make a plasmid that looks like this, which is the TI plasmid. So this is the insert that they toss into the TI plasmid. Guess what LB and RB are? Left and right. Yeah, left and right border for the tDNA. So again, I'm I'm talking about structure of the TI plasmid. The tDNA is this part that actually gets cut out of the plasmid, passed through the type four secretion system and inserted into the plant genome with the VIR genes. Okay. So there's actually, just like a transposon, there's actually like consensus DNA sites that flank the left and the right on the TI plasmid borders of the tDNA. And they're called, in this paper, they're calling them LB and RB. Um, what? What is that, um, this, maybe this is kind of like a broad biological concept, is, what is that term for whenever two things evolve a similar function outside of each other? Like bats with wings and birds with wings? It's convergent evolution. Is that the same? Well, wait, 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 you said bats and what? Like bats have wings and birds have wings. Like it's two completely different and like... If they're independent evolutions of wings, it's called convergent evolution. Is if they're one evolution in a common ancestor that then inherited that, that is homology. Would this be considered a type of convergent evolution of transposons? Similar you could say, yes, I would say, I would say, I would agree with that. Really? Like, well, but I would not say like, I would not say tDNA is uh, like, it's definitely not like homologous to transposons, but I would say that the I, the premise of like integrating a, a set like region of DNA is is has evolved multiple times in viruses, plasmids, and transposons. So yes, you could call that at a molecular level, you could call that convergent evolution. I like that. Make sense? Okay. Um, so this was the first thing they try to insert. And I was actually confused, like why do they want to try to insert this? Because it's only got two of the genes. I think it was honestly just like them testing it out. And they get it, they get it inserted. Um, they check for, they check for insertions 
with what's called, I'm gonna introduce a new method here, which is, what, although nobody uses it anymore, uh, which is a southern blot. What do you think a southern blot is? What, you don't want me to introduce more methods? Does it use antibodies? It doesn't use antibodies, but it's definitely similar to a western blot. So what, let's remember what a western blot is. What's a western blot? Western blot like, uses primary and secondary antibodies to bind to proteins and express like those. Like, it's, so you see just that one. But. It's antibodies to recognize a specific protein. So uh, southern blot is using probes to recognize a specific DNA sequence. And the premise is same, like you run an agarose gel, you transfer the stuff to a membrane, and then you can add the probes. And how do you think the probes recognize the specific sequence? They are like primers. They're just like primers, like they match, they anneal to the sequence because they have the same sequence, they're, so they're this, homologous. So this is like a temperature dependent grade, or like? I mean a temperature dependent. So the primers, are like were they, so they can anneal correctly? Uh, I don't, there might be like, I actually don't know, I've never done a southern blot. There might be like a heating and a cooling step, maybe. Um, but I, I think, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if you actually heat it up or not. Um, somebody should fact check it. Just know that there's probes, they're called probes. They're essentially like oligonucleotides that have, that fluoresce. And they can find the sequence just through hydrogen bonding. Okay, so it's a very, it's essentially like, it's essentially like, like Western blot does what type of molecules? Proteins. This is kind of like the idea of a Western blot, but applied to nucleic acids. And you can also, so is that, is that not, that's not, shouldn't be too hard. It's just like, it's just like, let's just take this concept and apply it to nucleic acids. Okay. Well, there's also, there's also a Northern blot. Guess, guess what a Northern blot is? Not lipids, it's it's RNA. Oh. So it's essentially like let's do the same thing as the southern except with RNA. There's an eastern blot too. What's the eastern blot? I've never heard of that one. To analyze proteins post translational modification. Interesting. I really just want to know where the things are. These are kind of like these are these are kind of like out of fashion. Like most people nowadays would just kind of like sequence. Um, it would like you could you can pull down sequence and just like run it through a sequencer and you could probably get, do, like it would probably be cheaper just to sequence nowadays. Yeah. Um, I mean, this could be like why maybe it's not used anymore, but like the difference between Southern blot and just normal amplification of your amplicon. Like, like a PCR? Yeah, how's that different? Okay, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Like, so they're using this to, to identify uh, they're using this to answer a few different hypotheses or questions. They're using this to identify a uh, number of inserts. So if you did a PCR, would you be able to tell, well, okay, nowadays you can, you can do this, but in like old school, this is in 2000, you just do a straight up PCR. Can you tell how many copies are there? Not with a, just a straight up normal PCR. Now, nowadays you can do a quantitative PCR and you, there are these curves and you can probably calculate from these curves how many copies were there. You probably could do that, but in this day and age, I don't think they were doing that and Southern blot was probably easier at the time. And so essentially like what they do for a Southern blot is you take like, isolate like the genome, the chromosomes of the plant. You add a few restriction enzymes. So it just literally like cuts up the genome in random spots. You run it on a gel, so you're gonna get bands of things from the genome, and then you do your blot, and one of these bands or two of these bands will light up if they have the insert for on their on their region of DNA. So if you saw a if you saw a product that looked like if your gel if your gel looked like this, how many insertions would you include that there were? or conclude that there were, if it looked like this. Two, Two. like you could actually tell the number of insertions based on a Southern blot. So this is good for a plant, um, this was good for these 
plant genetics because in theory, if you have more insertions, you might get better expression, right? So if you saw something that looked like this, you'd conclude that there were four insertions. So the tDNA can in in insert randomly and it can insert like multiple times. And that could be beneficial. So essentially like know that they use agrobacterium to do this insertion and then they checked if it was inserted and checked the number of insertions with Southern blot. So if you wanted to look at the data, that's what you'd be looking at. Okay. Then once they realize like they can insert these two genes, then they just built some, essentially like another construct that had the gene three. And then they inserted them both at the same time, this thing and the other thing with gene three. So that then the inserts now had the three genes and then they did final Southern blots to confirm that all the three genes were present. Okay. And then essentially they just looked at the rice kernels. Yeah. Um, so you said that they that the, the tDNA can insert multiple times. How did they know after looking at Southern blots, like say that they saw three insertions, how did they know that like gene one that just didn't get inserted three times? Well, you would do a Southern blot for probes specifically binding this. And then you'd combine that with a Southern blot for probes that specifically match this. And then you'd do a southern blot for probes that specifically matched three. And then you could say that you could isolate, okay, this particular line, it's got three insertions of, well, I mean, if this construct inserts, these are gonna have the same number. Does that make sense? Yeah. But if you did this on a separate construct, which they did, they'd say, okay, there's two of these inserts and three of these inserts. At least we can conclude, conclude that, like, it's got all three genes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so that's essentially like what they did. And then they looked at the kernels in the microscope. And it's actually interesting to read the methods. They like polish the seeds in probably like a rock polisher or something. And they have these like really shiny seeds. And the seeds are essentially like, you can see the, gene, the ones that have the inserts, they're, they're yellow, they're golden because beta carotene, which is found in carrots, guess what color it is? It's like orange, yeah, like yellow. So that's why they give it the name golden rice like you can actually visually see the, the stuff in there. So it's definitely working. They have a nice visible marker. Um, and that's how the golden rice was created. Okay, so with that said, like we all understand the premise of now how this was made. There are actually lots of controversies about golden rice. Like, it sounds really nice, right? Like we're gonna prevent people in third world country from going blind by making golden rice. What, what, why do you think this might be problematic or controversial or what problems do you think might have they encountered? Well, socially people just don't like GMO. It's a GMO. It's a GMO, yes. Uh, definitely like some people don't like GMOs. This case, like the only argument against it it, well, okay, we'll, we'll, um, like there's a lot of to unpack there. And I, I would say like, I'm actually kind of torn when I read about all the stuff about this, like I actually don't know where I fall on this. I don't know if I'm anti-golden rice or pro-golden rice. Um, certainly like I'm not the argument that like, oh, it's just a genetically modified organism that's unhealthy for you. That's BS. Um, but there are correct arguments if you frame them properly. Let's try to unpack this like more specifically. like. What else might issues might people have encountered? Could like could the consumption of golden rice you could overdose on that particular vitamin by eating too much of it? It's actually opposite of that. What's the uh, what would what would be the what, what's the opposite of that? People think they're getting an overdose of it. Yeah, at, and that when I read this, I was actually kind of like I had I had thought that uh, this was like a real success story when I first heard about it. But then when I read about it, it's actually like, that's the case is, is actually, it's the problem is the golden rice does not actually produce very much beta carotene. So I actually looked at the numbers. It's something like 0.5 micrograms per gram. And if you compare that to carrots, carrots have 13 uh, micrograms per gram and spinach has 111 micrograms per gram. So it's kind of like, why don't you just feed these people spinach and carrots? Like, why are you trying to give them this and pretending to them that they're gonna get their vitamin A 
when they're actually not. And somebody calculated the number they would have to eat 3.75 kilograms of golden rice per day to get the to get the like daily dose of vitamin A. So it was kind of like totally BS. And um, the FDA, so the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S., actually did not approve the golden rice strain because they essentially determined it was like a con job. Like you can't say that this has nutri nutritive value because it's not giving enough vitamin A. It's not that it's not there, it is there, but it's not there at high enough quantity to be nutritively uh, like useful. And the other thing is that what people have noticed is, so people will grow rice and then what do you do with rice? Like what's rice famous for, I guess? Like you can store it, like it lasts forever, you can put it in, like, if you store the golden rice, there's a huge degradation of beta carotene over time, especially if you don't have like good storage conditions, you're like in a hot climate or something. So not only does it not have enough, but it degrades super rapidly. So it's kind of like a con. Okay. So I do think this is a good, so again, I say like I'm kind of like torn. I do think this is a good example of what commonly happens in biotechnology where people like oversell what can be done. And in some senses, they're selling you snake oil when in reality, like the most simplest solution, like what would be the most simple solution? Give them, yeah. Eat a carrot, give them carrots or spinach or just give them a vitamin. Yeah. Like in some cases, the simplest solution is, is, is probably like the best solution to the problem. And people have, they've invested billions of dollars in making these GMOs. And you do wonder, well, what if that money was just spent to like giving people vitamins? Yeah. Like, would that be a better program? And the answer I think is probably yes. But in the original condition, oral delivery of vitamin A is problematic. Say what? In introduction part duration, oral delivery of vitamin A is problematic. So you're saying like if you just take a vitamin, it might not be absorbed properly? But I mean the golden rice is going to be orally taken. You know what I mean? Yeah, I guess it's not like the, it's because it's not pure. Maybe. If you, take, Maybe. if you take a vitamin A supplement, are you directly getting vitamin A or are you getting beta carotene? I don't know. Like there's all these different yeah. like forms of vitamins yeah, and stuff. I yeah. Like animal nutrition right now. <laughs> and okay, okay, so let, like, let's, let's talk from the other perspective. Like, so that's one, per I don't, I, like I said, like I'm actually kind of like undecided. The other perspective is, well, we've at least made some progress. And so like there are publications um, from studies done in China and there are, there are uh, studies that I read where people are actually asking people in these countries like, well, would you, which would you rather have? Like, would you rather have the one that gives you a little bit? And there are studies that suggest it's at least a little bit enough that it might prevent you from like dying. So would you rather have something that gives you a little bit or none? It's like, well, I'd kind of rather have the one that gives you a little bit. And we can still like keep working on this. Like there are some studies, okay, like at least like the premise is true. We can have rice that makes beta carotene. What would we do? Maybe we can tweak the promoters. Maybe we can tweak the inserts. Maybe we can do some more genetics to get or maybe we can adjust some things to try to make it more stable. Like there's an argument to be made that, okay, like this is proof of principle, let's keep working on it. Maybe we can make it better. Um, so I'm not, I'm not like totally against it. Um, it's kind of like one tool in our arsenal of tools and it might contribute to solving the problem. But there are some more, okay, more reasons, more reasons why you might be against this. Um, and this is more like, these are the arguments that I agree with that are sort of like anti-GMO. Okay, one, one counter to the idea that this is a good idea, let's use this, is guess who, guess who makes and creates the seeds? Already rich, like... A company, right? Like a big corporation. I'm certainly not like anti-corporation, like I'm a capitalist, but... But when you do this, guess who the farmers in the third world countries have to pay for their seeds? They have to pay the corporation. And so the farmers become like indebted to paying perpetually for seeds for the corporation. Whereas if they had their own seeds and their own strains, they're not dependent on that corporation. So 
One argument against GMOs is if you have this super popular GMO, you create scenarios where all the farmers become dependent upon that corporation for those seeds. Okay. And that could be a bad thing. I mean, like, like couldn't you just, once you have the crop yourself and you start growing, no, that's the problem. You're, if you, if you you're not allowed to do that. So once you, once you, you have to buy the seeds, seeds every year. And actually, well, and nowadays, actually, in biotech companies, um, they will engineer the crops so that if you try to breed them, they'll die. Like you, you literally, like the, I actually just posted a movie on that. Like you can, you can breed the crops so that if you ever try to like grow this in your own field without like sort of like buying the seeds, they'll die. This is just a money making scheme. Like, in some, well, in some sense, it's a money making, like again, like I'm not anti-capitalist. Like they have to be able to make some money. Otherwise there's no incentive to solve the problem, period. But it does make you wonder, like, well, why not just give them carrots? Why not just give them vitamins? Like, it does make you wonder. Okay, the, so the one downside is, is like they become indebted to these corporations. The second thing to be aware of is, guess what happens to uh, essentially like seed genetics diversity? Um, yeah, so like one thing that's super important to understand about the GMO debate, which most kind of like dumb people don't realize, this is actually like a really good argument. If you make if you make a really popular GMO, like for example, BT corn. BT corn in the United States, like 95% of all corn grown in the United States is BT corn. The diversity of the genetics in that system just plummets. And so what could be a uh, bad outcome, a secondary outcome of not having good genetic diversity. You'll get wiped out by the next virus that infects seeds or that infects rice. So the next time a virus comes that affects this genotype, you're gonna have no diversity and there will be a huge famine and a bunch of people will starve. Whereas if you have the old school way where everybody had their like dad's seeds that they were breeding their own strains and you have this all this kind of genetic diversity, a virus might come in, but it might only wipe out one person's field. And then the community will still be okay because they still have this genetic diversity. So an actual argument against like the GMOs is you see this drop in genetic diversity if everybody is growing this one particular strain of rice. So that's something to like be aware of. That's something to be skeptical of. Um, and then the final argument against like the let's just try to make it better argument is well, if they've already spent $24 billion on this, might it be better to spend that money elsewhere in other causes that might be more effective solutions to the problem? Once you start hitting numbers like in the billions, I think that argument becomes a lot more valid. Um, so those are like, understand there is a lot of nuance to this debate. And most of the time when you read articles, you're reading like very stupid surface level arguments against this, but there are legitimate arguments against the GMO idea. So just understand that, uh, and I would conclude with that, unless there are questions. Okay. If you were to yeah. engineer a plan similar to this, what would you do? Like if, like how would I try to solve these problems? No, if you just, no, if you just had like one thing that you decided to fix, kind of like they wanted to add this vitamin into this plan, <coughs> Oh, you're saying like if I was to tackle a problem like yeah. this, what do I want? To, well, I want to make I want to make uh, sweet peas that have psilocybin, which is the magic mushroom drug. <laughs> that's what I want to do. Um, that's how I want to contribute to humanity. <laughs> that's what I would do. Other questions? Why sweet peas? Because uh, they taste good, and then they'd be and then they'd be blue. You don't like sweet peas? Neutral. <laughs> I'll eat them. They are also actually, 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 Alec told me this when I pitched the idea. He was like, he was like, that's actually, he was like, that's actually a really good idea because the sweet peas are covered and psilocybin will degrade in the sunlight. So you'd actually like protect it by the by the pea pod. <laughs> okay. I have a question as well about yeah. the, the genetic diversity. Yeah. 
Like, yeah, there's definitely you, solutions to that. Could you so, do so, the same engineering on a lot of different strains? So, so yeah, you could do that. And so that's what they do with mosquitoes. That's a huge concern with the mosquito stuff is, okay, hang on, let me answer this question for a second. So the question is, how can you take a better strategy to prevent the loss of diversity? One way is you make the process of making the transgenic insert really easy. That's what they do with mosquitoes now. So with mosquito transgenics, They'll go to the spot, pick a local isolate of that mosquito, genetically modify it so that when they're releasing it, they're not changing the genotype of the local population. So that's one solution is take, the, take a whole bunch of different strains, like you said, make the insert in different strains. Another scenario that you could do is you could make the insert in one strain and then you could do what's called back crossing, where you take the different strains and then you cross that genotype into those different backgrounds. But either way, like that's a long process. And imagine like, is it gonna be in the interest of the corporation to create 20,000 different like back lines of, of this one insert? No, they're like, they're never gonna do that. So just by based on like profitability, you're never gonna see that done. But there would be strategies um, like to mitigate the loss of diversity. But it's a huge concern because it never happens. Mm -hmm. Like the easiest way is usually the way that's taken if that makes sense, mm -hmm. yeah.